what it is, Bradley, back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today in the studio, folks, I got a real treat for you, Eric Spofford. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. That is, yeah. Eric Spofford in the house. Folks, if you guys don't know who he is, you can follow him on social media, at Eric Spofford, or go to SpoffordEnterprises.com, but you're basically the CEO of Spofford Enterprises, that's which right. basically yeah. means you're a rich dude. <laughs> yeah. That's basically what that means. When you sold out your company and got your first chunk of change, was that the most money you ever had in your whole life? Fuck yeah, it was. Were you just a normal dude before that? No no real dough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I started with no dough. My dad cut trees down for a living or wore boots every day. So you remember what it's like to have zero dollars. 100%. So, so that compared to now having watches like the one you got on, what kind of watch you got there? This is a uh, Richard Milley RM3501 oh, Raphael. Jump change. Jump change. So how does it feel? What's the difference in feeling? Freedom. Freedom. Do you sleep better? Yeah, fuck yeah, you sleep better. Access, freedom. Are you happier? Yeah. So money does buy happiness? <laughs> I've been, listen, I've been broke. I've been homeless. I've been a lot of things that most people don't want to be. Most things that most people don't want to be. And I've been rich as fuck. I'll take rich as fuck every time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Give you a bomb on that one. Appreciate so pay attention, folks. I'm telling you that when the bombs drop, you better listen up because that's when like bombs have been dropped. Yeah. A lot of times people are like, you know, in my mind, for example, everybody goes through that shit, right? Like I, I was drunk and homeless and fucking, I didn't ever do heroin though. So you were a you, you were crack guy, right? So were you like in high school a druggie? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started smoking weed, drinking real young, selling drugs real young. Um, got in trouble for selling weed for the first time, fifth grade. Yeah, but how'd you get to heroin? That's heavy duty shit. Right Fourteen there. years old was uh, nineteen ninety nine. Uh, OxyContin, homeboy that I grew up with, brought over a forty milligram pill, split the thing up, and uh, got high on opiates for the first time. Con- OxyContin make you feel like same thing. Heroin makes you feel like. It's invincible. I, <laughs> I guess it don't know. feel like yeah. either. Like, dude, I always tell people, listen, I, I took it easy. I did the easy stuff. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you know, Coke, meth, you know, acid, mushrooms, weed, like the easy things. Yeah. You know, as soon as you got to heroin, PCP or whoa, whatever it's called. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, this is intense. Hey, dude, that's just, <laughs> that's heavy duty drugs right yeah. there. What's that's funny like, about like so, second level. You know what's funny about that is I could do heroin and maintain, go to work, live like somewhat of a normal life for a long period of time. For me, what took me Have to- Have you ever seen this crack? That's what I'm trying to tell you, is that I would do heroin for long periods of time, and then I get this idea, I'm like, I'm going to get some crack. And I would get some crack, and then it would just burn my life. felt better, crack or heroin? Heroin. Damn, dude. I'm yeah. sure glad I didn't try it then. Yeah. Because the crack- Dude, that shit got me for like three days. I was sprung like a chicken. Yeah. But anyway, so it, it, this was what, 18, throughout high school, doing drugs, hanging 14 out. 14 years old, Oxycontin, 15 years old, heroin. And then heroin uh, and coke and everything else you can think of until what? I was about almost 22 years old. Dude, what about your parents? Uh, they split up when I was in fifth grade, stayed in a split house for a couple of years until I was about 12 and then ended up with my dad full time. And he didn't care or he was on heroin too? He did the best that he could. But he didn't He didn't know you were on heroin. He did eventually. I asked him for help for the first time, 17 years old. Yeah. And he knew I was a wild kid though. Like he might not have known heroin specifically, but I was getting arrested. I'm coming home you know, coming out of fights, I'm, you know, just all, all sorts of crazy shit all the time. I was a handful. So you, you turned 22 and then you got sober. What made you do that? It had been, you know, I was on the top of the game for a long time. And then the last couple of years of addiction, uh, it really beat the shit out of me and it was really pathetic. And I had been homeless, couch surfing, in and out of jail. And on December 6th of 2006, I was dope sick. I was in withdrawals. And I mean, I was 135 pounds. I just got out of jail again a couple of weeks before this. Broke, I assume. Broke as shit. Because, dude, what if you had the money you had now and you were infected like you were then? I, I would just be dead. Yeah. 100%. God. <laughs> like, or you'd be broke. One of the two, like, dude, nothing ever good happens with drugs. Yes or no? Nothing ever good ever. happens with drugs. Like you, like you said, I was on top for a little while. Like, we all are. 
Yeah. You know, thinking everything's going great, but yeah. if drugs are involved, you, it's going to crash one day. Would you agree? hundred percent. You know, in the recovery circles, they say it ends up in, in jail institutions or death. That's the outcome. Stay in it long enough. That's where you end up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but you said, uh, you know, I was riding high and then, you know, a couple of years I, it was bad. I was, it kicked my ass. What do you mean by that? Like, did you look I like terrible. a heroin freak? Yeah. 135 pounds, track marks, skinny, emaciated, just pathetic. Sores on your face? No, nah, that's more meth. Oh, no sores. But, you know, the people going like this on the side of the road, what's that? That's heroin. Yeah. It makes it itchy. Which was it? But, yeah. So, so you, were you hanging around those type of people? Yeah. So, so, you, so you were like a, a, a druggie. Yes. Bad news. Would you rip people off? Rob stole. That's what happened was the, the day, the last day that I used drugs, I robbed a kid for $82. With a kitchen knife. So you get more? Yeah. Those are the last four bags of heroin I bought, four twenty dollar bags with that eighty two bucks. That's that was six two thousand six. I've been sober since the next day. And that was a catalyst. Yeah. Because usually when people like finally make the decision to get sober and stay that way, it's usually after something major happens. Yeah. Yeah. Police locked the neighborhood down. They knew the gig was up. I was probably going to prison and uh, I took off the next morning. I was in the state of Maine. I went back to New Hampshire, my home state, and uh, was what I believed on the run for armed robbery. And, you know, was just confronted with the truth of my life. And I was like, I either need to get sober and change or I'm going to die or go to prison and like no more baby bids. I'm going to go for a long time. So that's what you did. That's what I did. Got sober. Yeah. And is that what led to opening up a, a, a sober place? Yeah, I got sober in 2006, got very passionate about helping others in recovery, and then in 2008, I opened uh, the state of New Hampshire's first sober living house. And that's just where people go to live and stay sober? Yeah. Because of what? The constant meetings and support and shit? Yep, exactly. Yeah, rules, structure, meetings, accountability. Did you live there? I lived there. So for it's like a halfway years. house. Yeah, and I lived with them for the first two years, but yeah, they lived As there. their sponsor? Yeah, pretty much. Because you've been there. Yep. Did you ever, like, because I'd, I'd make too many jokes with them. You know, I'd be like, dude, like, <laughs> look, you can have a beer. You can have a beer. Just don't have more than one. Yeah. Because you talk to the addicts, they say they can't even have a beer. And I'm like, that's weird. You can't just drink a beer and then that's it? They're like, no. Can you drink, if you drank a beer right now, what would happen? I don't know exactly what would happen, but it would be bad. And see, that's what all freaking addicts say. Like, I, I'll bet you anything. You could drink a beer, Eric, and nothing would happen. Why? Because because you're smarter than you were. Like, I don't think that's going to lead. But I'm not an addicted alcoholic or, or uh, heroin guy. Here's the thing. I'm making assumptions. Yeah. So I don't want to lead anyone to go drink a beer that's been sober. I would say stay sober because... You know yourself better than I do, but still in my mind, I was. You know, you might be right. The problem is, is what if you're wrong? You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I, my experience, I've tried that a thousand times. I just believe that when people used to have a problem and, and we convince them that they always have a problem. Because right now you would say you're an addict. Yeah, I was. Are you? I would say for how, how long since you've done anything stupid? 16 plus years. You're no longer an addict. Like, addicts have to do it. You don't have to. Clearly, you are no longer an addict. That's what I say. Again, I guarantee you AA people, that no one's going to agree with me. I got one that works here. I'll go <laughs> grab him. He'll, you and him can gang yeah. up on me. Brad versus Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, yeah, because, dude, listen. One versus millions. If you don't do it after a period of time, you're no longer one. Like if I were an alcoholic, I had to have alcohol every day. I drank, I drank, I drank, I drank. And then I said, fuck it, I'm done. And I didn't drink for five years. I'm not an alcoholic anymore. Well, then, I mean, it, it brings a lot, of, a lot of philosophical questions. Well, okay, well, the, does that mean it's okay for you to drink? <laughs> That's irrelevant. So, the question is, is why am I titling myself an alcoholic when I'm no longer an alcoholic? You are no longer an addict. It, no, in my book, I do not think it, Eric Spofford is an addict. I think you were one. Okay, but that would mean that I may be able to recreationally, with power control and the ability to moderate, use a mind-altering substance such as a drug or alcohol. Like, like I can. You probably not what I am. This I know, but I mean, I can't. I, I believe you. I could do a line right now and not do a line tomorrow. <laughs> there, are, I could, I could do anything today and not do it tomorrow. There's a, but there's a fine line between people that have had a substance use problem and addiction. 
Yeah, like That's I a, said, I said on on social media one time, I got hooked on crack for three days. Everyone said it's total bullshit. It's, it's not how it works. You don't just stop crack in three days, dude. I swear on my kids' health, it's it's, it's it was all true. But I got you know, wing. Oh shit! Oh, I smoking the shit out of that shit. But then, but then I spent my night in my bedroom with my lungs that felt like there was an elephant stepping on my chest and I could barely breathe. And and when I took a big breath, it hurt like a fucking son of a bitch. And so that scared the shit out of me. I thought my lungs were collapsing. And so I woke up the next day and said, fuck this, I'm getting out of here. And I moved. I got out of the environment and never touched it again. So does that make me a crackhead? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to the according to Alcohol Anonymous, you're always one. So if I was a crackhead once, I'm no, always a crackhead. Alcoholics Anonymous actually has clear literature on this that people have, you know, problems with alcohol and drugs, but that doesn't necessarily make them alcoholic or drug addicted. What you exhibited there was the power to control and the power to make a decision and follow through and you follow through for a long period of time. And so have you. Not really, though. What are you talking about? You haven't drank for 16 years. I still participate. I drank golfing this recovery. last weekend. You're doing way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not here to convince I, you. If, but this, this is going to make for a good If I drank golfing last weekend, I wouldn't be sitting here on the podcast with you. You made it to the podcast. I'd probably be in jail by now. Well, again, you because if, if that's... If that's if, in other words, you don't know how to say no... Well, then don't say yes. Correct. That's the bottom line. That's right. And and you guys, the other fellow here included, will say, you don't want to see me if I have one. That's right. I'm like, God damn, like, is that crazy where you can't even have one? That sucks. Because, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he says that sucks. Well, yeah, because, I mean, it's, it's kind of fun to go, you know, get a little buzz now and again, don't you think? Not heroin. Not <laughs> heroin. That's heavy. But a drink, a beer. If I could, I would. But every time I got off a of heroin and coke and everything else, and then I tried to drink, it, it you know, I would have a couple of drinks, and I'd be like, Brad, you know what sounds like a good idea on this golf course with a couple of drinks in us? Let's go get a bag of coke. And then I get. And, and then I'd say, Eric, you know where the fuck that leads, bro? Go home, get some sleep. You can't, you can't be like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that's not how that's gonna go. Yeah. Well, listen. At the end of the day, folks. What would you say to someone listening to this? Because what I'm really doing right now is trying to think like and act like all the ones that can't get sober. That's what they're thinking is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I can do one. One ain't going to fucking hurt. And then what happens is what you're saying. So I'm just like playing devil's advocates for all the people out there that might be right now on that high that you said you were on before you crashed. Yeah. Because I can tell you if you're doing drugs and alcohol and you're abusing them, you're going to crash. Would you agree? 100%. And when you do. It doesn't last forever. Yeah. And when you do, I bet you you listen to your voices in your head and you're going to, and they're, they're going to sound like what I was sounding like. Yeah. Dude, you can have one. Come on. Let's just have one. Come on, dude. We're golfing. We can have one. <laughs> right? Do you constantly hear that in your head or no? I don't anymore. It's been a long time. Yeah. So that means. In my book, you're fucking healed, bro. Congratulations. You're no longer an addict. You you you've graduated. Graduated. Yes. And and I think in my mind, if I were teaching a bunch of ex addicts, ex addicts, I would I would teach them to to do do not think you're an addict any longer. Don't do it again. <laughs> don't start. But don't think you're an addict. Why is that? Well, I think because the higher your self worth, the higher your net worth. And if I were to, if someone were to try to convince me I was an alcoholic because I've been fucked up a million times, I was a fucking druggie because I did drugs a million times, I wouldn't believe them. I'd say, fuck you, I'm no druggie because I'm not one. And neither are you, coincidentally. Not anymore. W were you, like, for straight up, like, you you couldn't stop? No, yeah, dude, I was hardcore. Because I know, I know friends of mine that, like, you know, they didn't stop snorting coke either you know they were every weekend oh fuck yeah dude and i'm like dude you're cokeheads pretty much they couldn't they didn't want to stop i should say yeah so did you want to stop but just couldn't i wanted to stop for years and used against my own will damn yeah but you turned it around so that led to opening this the the thing that you sold for how many millions 115 115 milli. So you went from freaking shooting heroin, being a loser, 
being a loser. To freaking selling a company for 115 million schmacks. Schmackaroos. Clean and sober, obviously, thank mm -hmm. God. Do you think that, do you think maybe that's the reward? Because uh, if you didn't get sober, dude, you wouldn't open up the sober living. I just the foundation. A lot more shit had to happen in order to get there. You know what I mean? Hey, you know a guy by the name of, um, he was on my show. He has tattoos. Why is his name escaping me? He's like a gambler. Mickey? Is it Mickey? He was, now that, now that I'm talking to you, he was a uh, very similar story where he got involved with sober living or a, an addiction house. And I think he made a bunch of money too. Is there a bunch of money in sober living? It's like so many people want to pay for it and get in it. Yeah, it's a good industry. It's about a $35 billion industry, addiction treatment. Wow. So there's a lot of freaking addicted people is what you're saying. Dude. What's up with fentanyl? It's a leading cause of loss, of accidental loss of life in adult Americans now. Five, now, six, see, now five, see, five or six years ago, it surpassed car accidents. Yeah, but you see, those everybody knows what fentanyl is. Like, like, I've heard that you can, there's people that put fentanyl on door handles to fucking harm people. So you touch a door handle. That's some evil shit. And it's got fentanyl on it. You could die. Like, if it's that illegal, if it's that deadly of shit, how is it legal? It's not legal. How is it being made? How is it being distributed? They say it's made in China and imported, but- How is it made? Cartels in a lab. It's synthetic. It's made out of chemicals. Like It's, like, it's like cook and crank or meth. Yeah. It's very similar to that. Like heroin's made from the, the poppy plant, right? Um, and but, if, but if I controlled the poppies, you couldn't make heroin. Correct. So that's what I mean. Like, you know, there, there's things out there that you're buying. Like one time I knew this dude that, you know, was cooking meth and he'd go buy the shit at normal places. Very uh, few restrictions when you bought the ingredients for it. Back in the day, yeah, they've placed a lot of restrictions. The main ingredient, I forget what it's called, the meth is actually in Sudafedrin, Sudafed. W w what I'm afraid of with the fentanyl and the kids is, you know, friend of yours says, here, take this pill. It's fucking fun. And there's fentanyl in it. And then they just died. It happens all the time. It happens every day. It's unbelievable. So what does fentanyl make you feel like? Because people are voluntarily taking fentanyl. Yeah. That's how addictive it is. Uh, what does it make similar, you feel like? Similar to heroin. They're all the same drug class. Oxycontin, heroin, fentanyl are all opiates, opioids. And I may be blind because I keep reading headlines that there's an opiate, uh, uh, pandemic of opiates mm -hmm. fentanyl being at the lead where is it all happening like i don't see a bunch of people dying on fentanyl all over the streets where is fentanyl being distributed everywhere and they smoke it they snort it what smoke do they do it, it snort it shoot it fentanyl yeah dude isn't the word out fentanyl will kill you yeah but it's the insanity of addiction and the powerlessness around it you know, the crazy thing, this is how fucking crazy it is out there that you'll have a dope dealer that has a batch of dope that people are dying off of and the addicts go hunt it out because that's a good shit. Think about that. Think about that. It's crazy. And so, you know, I, over the course of 13 years, start to finish in that business from opening it to selling it, I had probably close to 60,000 clients. So you see it all. How'd you, how'd you, so what made you start this business? It was a labor of love. I never thought it was going to be a big business. It was, I wanted to help people. You know, I had been affected myself. I watched all my childhood friends get addicted and struggle. And, um, you know, I just wanted to, I was very passionate about helping people in recovery. And obviously it was working and people were loving it. So mm -hmm. word spread and you opened up another center, another center, another center type yeah. thing. Yeah. Is it still open? Yeah. Yeah, it's owned by a private equity backed strategic business now. But they're but they're helping people get sober every day. Still going. Still it's in the same house you were in? Are Not they, that original one, but all the real estate. You know, we had What if I what if I were in real estate? Because I know you're also a real estate investor, et cetera, et cetera. So what if I wanted to open up a sober living? How hard would that be? What permits do I need? Zoning and fire code. That's it. But you you know, sober living is just one one corner of, of the business. That's not all of what I did. I did a full continuum of addiction treatment. So most of my facilities, the the uh, the better performing ones were actually licensed healthcare facilities. So you have to get like 
the pros in there to yeah. counsel and shit? Doctors, therapists, psychiatrists. Well, you always hear when you, when I was growing up, like Malibu. Yeah. You know, Malibu Sober Living or whatever it was called. Yeah. Where the movie stars would go. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you built? Yeah. And where was this at? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Um, and you built the state's biggest, it became the biggest, you said? Yeah, really the northeast section of the country's biggest and arguably the east coast's biggest. There's 440 treatment beds, 325 employees. We did about $55 million of top-line revenue. So if, if someone was listening to that right now in that business, what would you say as far as you know tips go for, like, hey, do this, 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 and it'll grow? What were you doing to attract all the people? One, you have to do a really good job, right? Like there's good treatment and there's bad treatment. So you're going to take the responsibility of providing the services very seriously and have a quality treatment product. And because that the the clients, which are the patients and their loved ones, they know. Yeah. And you develop a reputation and a brand, you know, on the street amongst them. And so like a pretty brochure on a website, you can have that all day long. But the streets know which spot is which spot. Our spot was the good spot. It was the spot you want to change your life, that's where you go. We did a really good job on it. And then we had, you know, like any other business, we had a boots on the ground sales team. Um, they would do outreach to therapists, hospitals, police, fire, clergy, et cetera, et cetera. So they'd say, you know any addicts, send them our way. Yeah. And then we also had a very strong digital media presence. And so most people looking for stuff now, of course, go to Google. You know, I need a drug rehab. My son needs a drug rehab. And so we had considerable efforts to be top of mind on the internet okay so that was one give me three like if i were if i were out there There's doing three. what you do but i'm do not a good job have a sales team do and a good digital marketing strategy nowadays nowadays did you have did when did you start this thing 2006 2008 so it was barely digital marketing back then there was none back then that developed over time. I remember when Google AdWords was brand new. So how did you grow it until we finally are to a place now where you can advertise easily? I mean, back in 2008, it was still the yellow pages, right? And so it was a lot of handshakes. It was a lot of, you know, relationship-driven type marketing. Now, and, and at some point it was successful or you wouldn't be able to sell it. So so was it, so you, were you making money by when you, when you got your big chunk of change, your yeah. first big chunk of change? Were you making money? Yeah. So you weren't like you had a nice car, you had a nice place, had a nice car, a nice house. So the money didn't change that because you always think when someone says they sold their company, there's instant money. But in reality, oh, I've been living a good lifestyle for a long time. Yeah. So that's where I want to go. So yeah. at what point were you starting to up your lifestyle, start getting the cars, the watches? Probably. Would anybody? And by the way, would anybody talk any shit about it? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, like freaking. You know, you're making money off people that are trying to get sober. There's two ways to tell Shame. the story. Yeah. No, I, there's two ways to tell the story. There's, look at this guy that has lived experience, a guy in recovery, changed his life, got sober. He's one of them helping them and, you know, built a big successful business. Because a big unsuccessful business wouldn't do a great job. You know, you want to have a, a successful business. Uh, and the other one is exactly what you're saying, kind of the heaters and, oh, he's making money and off a recovery and you know why do you think people shit. hate on that i don't know people hate on what they gave up on type of shit you know like jealousy envy so now you you cash out your freaking a millionaire multi-millionaire what's the first thing you you think in your head as far as like moving forward like i'm gonna open another business or i'm just gonna go golf yeah do you golf by the way i don't golf no Dang, dude, you don't golf with all that dough? Don't golf, don't drink. Fucking boring, right? Do you think golf and drink go together? Clearly. <laughs> no, you can go golfing without drinking. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you certainly can. You can't go golfing without smoking a cigar, though, so. I don't smoke cigars either. You you don't? don't you wouldn't smoke, smoke one? Dude, I, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I, You know what happened to me was I quit cigarettes, stayed absent from nicotine for years, started smoking cigars. Dude, I was off the chart with the cigars. So was I. Oh, dude, I'm outside in the winter in New Hampshire smoking an Ashton, freezing my balls off. I'm like, this is out of control. This is too much. So I quit nicotine. Then I got on the vapes. 
how fucking stupid was that? You know, grown ass man walking around with a fucking bong, these big clouds and shit. I, you know what made me stop just vaping when I started vaping? What's that? Some kid looked at me and said, freaking dude, it looks like you got a robot's dick in your mouth. <laughs> as soon as he said that I thought fuck I, I look like a fucking idiot and I'm yeah. sitting there going and I'm looking in the mirror puffing on this freaking metal thing and I'm like what the <laughs> fuck am I doing like and, and, and sometimes I'll get pissed off and realize and maybe this is why we're different I get pissed off and basically say you know fuck you I'm more powerful than that stupidity and I chuck it and I don't fucking touch it yeah now I don't vape but, you know, I'm not afraid to vape. I don't say I, I, in other words, if someone just said, here, taste this vape, I'm not afraid See, to go. that's the difference. I'm, I'd say, but vape, pass. Cigar, I'm not inhaling. I'm just puffing. Yeah. But I started doing cigars. I started smoking. I had a really hard time stopping. Dude, I was smoking five cigars a day. That's intense. Every day. That's a lot. And you know what made me stop? I don't know. My little girl said I stunk, and that's why they didn't run up and hug me anymore. That'll do it. They said I stunk. I said, "Why? how come you guys don't ever run up and give me a hug like you used to? And they go, you smell like cigars. And I'm thinking, damn. So I stopped, obviously. But I just stopped. Now, I smoke cigars during golf. Why? Well, because I'm not going to stop smoking cigars my whole life. I'm going to stop smoking them every day. I'm going to smoke one on occasion. I'm going to smoke one celebration. I'm going to smoke one when we're golfing. So golfing, celebration, or occasion. Now, what would an occasion be? Who decides? <laughs> I do. If you said, dude, I smoke cigars. Well, shit, I could say there's an occasion. Spofford's out here. Let's smoke a cigar. Yeah. I got good Cubans in there. Let's grab one, puff one down. Wouldn't bother me. I wouldn't do it. Oh, now I got to smoke five a day again. So maybe that's the difference, is I think in my head, fuck that is, the cigar. It, it ain't more powerful than me. That's exactly the difference. But the, but they're not more powerful than you. And you know that. That's why you stopped. That's why I stopped. But you're, you're not talking about stopping. You're talking about moderating. I have the power to stop and stay stopped. Where I have a problem is moderating and controlling and still... So I got more faith in you than you do. I don't know about that. Well, I, I, I must, because I think you could. Let's have a beer and a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll bet you anything, you will stop you and you will not move I forward. I would actually do this, so for the internet, this isn't going to happen. But I'm just saying, Brad, in a hypothetical world, if I thought I could get away with it, i say, oh, Brad, you know what? I'm going to take you up on your cigar and your beer, but on one fucking condition, you're going to stay with me till I stop. That's going to be a problem because we're going to be going for weeks. No. Oh, we're going to be doing cocaine. We're going to be in all sorts of sorted places. We're going to be doing some crazy shit. No, because I wouldn't let you. I'd say, dude, Good I'm out. Good luck. I'd say, I'm out. Well, you'd be you on break the condition. You huh? break the deal. That wasn't the deal. The deal was, you think I can have a beer? You got to stick with me till I'm done. We both can. Can you have a non-alcoholic beer? No, that's, that's fucking stupid. That's worse than, worse than having a robot's dick in your mouth. You that's know? like smoking, or that's like uh, snorting bacon soda. Yeah, that's right. Why the fuck would I do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, now, again, all the people listening are already, you know, aware, I think, of where, where you've been. Now, where where have you gone since? You sold your business. You got a 115 milli mail mail. Yeah. And then you became obviously cooled. Were you tatted up the whole time? I've been tatted a long time. So, yeah. so you got a bunch of money. You were already tatted. Yep. You already had your buddies, your friends. You weren't married. No. You still married or not married still? Not married. Dang, dude, a single bachelor with hundreds of mills. Moved to Miami. In Miami? Yeah. Bought a plane, that, that's, bought a boat. That, that sounds fun and sad at the same time. Why? Because, dude, Miami, in my mind, I have never lived there, so I'm just talking out my ass, is filled with freaking hot-ass chicks. Filled to the hot ass, with hot-ass chicks. All the way up. Like, you can't find a better spot than Miami when it comes to females. If you don't want to see them, you better stay the fuck in your house. What's that? I said, if you don't want to see them, you better stay the fuck in your house. Because they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah. And and why do you think they all go to Florida? Just the sun? Miami's a, a hot spot. You know, you get a lot of, of women that come up from Central and Southern America. Um, you live there still, I'm don't you? There. I do, yeah. I just flew in from there last night. So, so if it, obviously I say if you could live anywhere, you can live anywhere. And why do you choose there? I love Miami. The weather is unbelievable. Don't you think it's too humid? No, I love it. 
I love it. I was on my yacht all day yesterday. And, uh, you know, it was like, well, I forgot you're living the life of luxury. So I live life of luxury or at the boat, you know, we're chilling. Well, the life of luxury, I think anywhere is fun. I wouldn't want to be, you can move to Seattle right now and fucking people be envious of your lifestyle in Seattle. It doesn't matter where you are. Well, that's the thing about Miami is there's not really a lot of envy because there's so many people winning. You can't be rich in Miami. Like I got cars i got a plane i got a boat i got all the stupid shit and nobody even fucking looks no one cares where if you were in seattle with all that shit you'd have the whole city's attention yeah there's some rich some bitches in seattle i've never been to seattle so i don't oh there's some money in seattle really oh yeah is that right i've never been up there but again it's this the question is is like who who's impressed because again like if i had billions of dollars and you had jane planes and yachts and jets i wouldn't be impressed either because don't we all, you know, but, but most people will never, ever get that stuff. Yeah. Ever. What do you say to them? What do I say to people that'll never get that stuff? Yeah. Fucking work harder. I don't know. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of, <laughs> blah, blah. a lot of it's about self-awareness, you know? Uh, <laughs> some people don't want that stuff. Some people don't want to go through what it took to get it because we can sit here and talk about, you know, 38 year old Eric with the boat, the yacht and the Miami house and, and all this stuff. But you don't look at the 15 years of fucking 14, 16 hour days that it took to get here. And so. But it was fun for you. I loved it. Yeah. You know, I loved it, but it was fucking hard. Yeah. It was absolutely hard. It's very difficult. And I gave up a lot in the process. You know, people, my whole twenties, my whole early thirties, I didn't do shit. It didn't always I mean, go well, well, but no, didn't always go well. I mean, business is brutal. What What's so brutal about it? Fucking constant problems, you know, chief, uh, chief fire putter outer constantly just chasing around problems. Are you glad you don't have to do that anymore? I'm still, I, Dad, I'm working harder now than I've ever worked. I don't know why. <laughs> you're, you're doing it wrong, brother. <laughs> Some days I wake up and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing this all for? Like, why? Once you got a certain amount, bro, you can't go broke unless you're an idiot. It's hard to be that driven and that motivated and then just stop. And then Yeah, but, just, but, but it's just a different, in other words, little, you keep working, but it's just a different thing. So like, hand me $100 million. I put that $100 million into real estate like you do and probably a million other things. You're making, you know... Off that, you're making all kinds of money, period. Even if you don't do anything. That is literally waking up, working out, golfing. Why? Because it's all real estate and shit. It's just, you know, money going up. It's not work work. It's investing. Investing isn't work, is it? It takes a lot of time and energy to manage money. So if I gave you, so if you were out buying real estate and you were averaging 16% on the money, and I said, here, I'll give you 10 mil, Oh, I want backs 1.6 mil at the end of the year. You wouldn't do it? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. That's 1.6 million in the old shebangs hip national. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not, I mean, it's but not you, as easy you as to use my 10 mil. Like what Grant Cardone's doing, dude. Grant Cardone is getting, a, let's say, 1,000 people to give him 50 million bucks. But Grant's and, he's, and Grant has a big team that's working, and someone's going to manage that big team, and someone's going to be responsible for all that stuff. Yeah, but that's the machine. My point is, is I could could give my money to Grant and not have to do that. You could, yeah. I wouldn't be making what Grant's making with my money, but that's okay. I think people, like people, always ask, you know, hey, should I do, you know, investing with with certain people? Look, I don't know. I'm not going to endorse any certain individuals i don't know but i can tell you that investing smart yeah so what do you know about investing fair amount i mean you've been doing it for a while yeah because when you got a big chunk of change you, you don't just keep it in the bank do you no you want to deploy it what's that you want to deploy it so so what's the most liquid you've ever seen in your bank account a 70 mil and how did it feel to know it's just sitting there fucking strange like it's hard to contextualize that much but like you start thinking of shit like okay if a Lamborghini's 500 grand okay I could own like 140 of them you know what I mean alright if a, a house is two and a half million I could buy like fucking ten of them you know like you just 
it's hard. And then you start to realize I can have pretty much anything I want. Yeah. Because I always tell people like after a hundred million is pretty much the same. It is. It is. You know, like, other than toys, because again, if you had a hundred million and I had uh, nine billion, dude, I could big. I could make your stores or your toys look stupid, and you couldn't keep up. Like, dude, I could buy a five hundred million dollar yacht. Yep. There's five hundred million dollar yachts out there that people own. I think so. Isn't isn't there? I don't know about. I'm sure there is, but I drove past one the other day in Miami that was 300 feet long. It had a Bell helicopter parked on it, which is probably a three to five million dollar helicopter. My captain told me that yacht was 300 million dollars, and that without I had 40 people on staff, and without even going anywhere in it, it the cash burn to maintain and run it was 1.5 to two million a month. See what I'm saying? That's yeah. cr that's more than a jet. What's the most Maybe. expensive yacht in the world? Four point eight billion. Yacht in the world is the four point eight billion dollars gold plated. That's why that's too crazy. So I'd say the average yacht's probably a couple hundred mil. Big yacht, big ass. Ones. Big ass ones. Yeah. yeah. So, dude, if you only had a hundred, you couldn't do a two hundred million dollar yacht. So that's the only thing that that differs is is the size of ship. But I think once you have a hundred million, dude. You can do any fucking thing you want. Pretty much. Uh, and how does that feel? I want people to hear a description of how it feels. Because when freedom. it started for me, I had a, it, 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 I was tripping for a while. Yeah. Like, like I would literally go, I'd look at my bank account sometimes and, and I would play it for people. I would call people that I knew and I'd say, listen to this. And I'd click over and I'd dial the bank. <laughs> and 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 hit a sick fuck. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I they it would be like you know you have two point four million six hundred and they're like fuck dude, <laughs> you got two million bucks and I'm like dude that's just one account you dipshit it's fucking rolling in they're like it's just again I freaked out I, I it, it felt surreal. Is it for you or because you because it felt it, surreal it did not feel like reality, for sure. And now when you look down and you see the bad boy, see, that's what I'm saying. See, we got differences. See, I got a little white, white gold <laughs> shit yacht master. You got the old Richard meal. Yeah. The meal ticket. Buddy of mine got two of those ganked from him. Really? One at gunpoint, one, uh, they broke in his house. Aussie. Huh? California. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Dude, he's got, um, I think another two or three. And he still wears them. I'm like, dude, I would not wear that shit in California, dude. They're they're robbing you in broad daylight. I don't. Yeah. Fuck that. I don't like LA. And by the way, what do you think of, let's say you go get a fake one of those because you have the real one. I believe that you're allowed to have the fake one. So in other words, only if you have I the real one can you wear the fake one because if someone steals it, they'll steal the fake. Like I wish I could go get a fake wedding ring for my wife. So if anyone ever stole it, like, get, I'll get to the cubic more, zirconia. Yeah, they get the cubic zirconia, whatever it's called. They do the fake diamond. Yeah, it, but my wife would not go for it if I said I'm gonna. You're gonna wear a fake one. Don't worry about it, and no one will know. Just, no one. Yeah. Will know. No, she she. I'd have to lie to her too, tell her it's real. Yeah, but no. Um, I think if you have the authentic one, you should be able to have the fake one for protection for security. See, I don't know. I don't know that I would do that because if you try to rob me for a fake one or a real one, like you're gonna have to fucking kill me. Like I'm gonna. Hey, you there's me. a bomb right there. Yeah. It doesn't matter. This could take. I'm not taking take, it off. Yeah. Fake or not? Yeah, we both died right here. Yeah, but dude, I wouldn't die over a watch. I might. No, you wouldn't. I don't know, dude. I, you I, wouldn't I, die over a watch, dude. If someone said, "Hey, motherfucker, give me that watch," you're gonna say, "Fuck you, shoot me." I'd have a really fucking hard time taking this watch off. So I'd be like, click. <laughs> I'll go get another watch. I don't, you you can't replace a life, bro. Yeah. And dude, quite frankly, I don't want mine to end. I'm liking it so far. And by the way, like people say, Brad, you know, you've lived a pretty rough life yourself. I have. Um, I could go toe to toe with some price stories with you. Not as heavy as you though, but but. Definitely, I've had some ups and downs, but I don't see them as ups and downs. I don't even acknowledge them, really. It's almost like I'm thinking there's a, there's a 
some sort of mental thing happening where I bury and suppress it all. Because someone said, how did it feel to be homeless? Because I was homeless once. But I was homeless on the beach. I'd sleep on the beach in L.A. And I'm like, fuck, it's a beach, bro. Like, how is that, how is that <laughs> fucking, you know, rock bottom? Yeah. The guy says, how does it feel when you hit rock bottom? I'm like, uh, I haven't really hit rock bottom. He goes, didn't you say you were homeless on the beach? Yeah, but didn't you hear me say it was a beach? Yeah. Like, fuck, I slept on the beach. Do people pay for that? All I had to do was find a girl. So I slept on the beach, took a shower at the beach because there's the showers there and shit. And then I'd go f to malls and shit and meet people. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as I met a chick that was willing to let me stay with her, I was no longer homeless on the beach. <laughs> That's a good strategy. Of course. Yeah. Isn't that what you do? Yeah. That's what I did. And it worked. <laughs> But that, but that's also why I could, I could roll around like a vagabond and always be okay. Yeah. Like, dude, you could drop me off Just in any city in America and I will end up okay. Well, yeah. First thing you do is find the girl that has the shit you need. Like the first time I got married, people thought it was for love. She had a truck. What do these chicks look like though, Brad? She had a truck and I needed a truck, coincidentally. It's like fat chicks. And I knew if I married her, wouldn't that make that my truck? You guys listen, this is strategy right here. Yeah, so so again, I needed a truck on the first one, and then this, you know, I want to get myself in trouble if I keep talking. <laughs> <I'll wait. laughs> oh, that's funny, yeah. but all kidding aside, though, um, you know, I don't even know where I was going with that now. So so, <laughs> I'm trying to dig out for the for the bomb squad. Like, what's it feel like to freaking have real money? Because I want people to 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 get a glimpse. Because I think if you can get a glimpse. You can get it. It's people that had no clue that that level even existed. Yeah. Like, again, like sometimes, dude, I was talking to my buddy the other day. You might even know him. Chase Hero. Do you know Chase? I know Chase, yeah. I was talking to him the other day, FaceTiming his ass, and he showed me his Ethereum account. Off the charts. Like, off the charts. Like, freaking so much you can't even believe it. Like, the fuck is that? Like, that's fucking yours for real? Holy shit. And that's just an Ethereum account. You, you think that's all he's got? Mm -hmm. It's like thinking to myself, like, what kind of a fucking clown am I? I'm over here fucking jacking off thinking I'm cool. I ain't even close to cool, which gets me now. Okay, boom. It's possible. See, I want I want that for the bomb squad. Yeah. So give them some of that. Like, you know, how, what'd you feel like? Because you, you didn't start with money. You, you get a rich kid that's always been around money. It's not the same as if you didn't have money, you bro you grow up struggling, and then you finally the hit success. Word, the one word that keeps coming up is freedom, but to like dial down on that, it's like, I can do whatever the fuck I want to do, and I could have almost everything that I want to have. That's fucking wild. Like, you guys want to go buy a Lambo? Cool. Like, throw it on the Amex. Like, it's just total disrespect to things like, you know, it's wild. There's a lot to adjust to, too. Why so? Because it's it's just a lot to acclimate to. I think you have to acclimate to it when you come from nothing, right? When you come from being broke and you know what poverty feels like and you know homelessness, you know, to have that much money, that much power, you know, at your disposal... It's also fucking terrifying. Like, God, I don't want to fuck this up. Yeah. You know? That would suck. Imagine being the guy that had a hundred million and then was broke again. Dude, I I, I mean, to ass. me, a hundred million, you I don't think you can be broke again unless you're a stone cold idiot. But unless you'd have to be a stone cold idiot. Or or an addict. Like yeah. fucking dude, I bet you anything a hundred million would burn with an addict. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I I'm just convinced, and maybe that's why I'm also not an addict. Because I'm so convinced that, and I'm talking about an addict that's currently an addict, not one, not a recovering addict. Yeah, uh, an addict is going nowhere. I truly believe that. If you, if someone, if I know this person's hooked on coke, bro, I feel bad for you. You, you got problems. No matter what it appears like, or you're heading for them. One of the two. Scary shit. So, so right now you're coaching people. Yeah. You, 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 what are you coaching them on? Or are they uh, addiction or no success? I have some clients um, that I'm working with that are either starting, owning, scaling, or selling addiction treatment businesses, but that's a very small part of what I've been doing. 
uh, I've been coaching entrepreneurs, business owners, people with great how to scale. companies, how to scale, how to grow, what the next move is, how to professionalize, how to prepare for an exit. You know, it's everything from low seven figure, you know, who's the next right hire, how do, you know, how do I create systems? How do I create KPIs? How do I measure my business? All the way to mid and high eight figure businesses with more complex problems. And you have a handful of those, quite a few people. About 70 people in the program right now. Yeah. So if if someone in the bomb squad's listening, what's the what's the kind of perfect person that you can help the most? A business owner, entrepreneur that is looking to grow and scale their company, professionalize it, possibly sell it. Um, Do you even sell it? Yeah. Yeah, I walk people through the process of preparing the business to sell and bring it to the market. Oh, like a consultant in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking about cuz I'm 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 starting one where I'll I'll actually buy the business and or invest in it. So when people are looking for an investment or people want to sell their company to me, I'm going to start well, I already started. It's called Black Rhino Equity. That's great. Yeah. That's an idea that I've had as well. And so v- who knows just VC. Yeah, no doubt. Well, you know, so now the- I'm a venture capitalist, which is to me, trippy crying. Kid to I didn't even gra- I didn't even graduate high school. <laughs> Me either. But now I'm a venture capitalist. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? That means I have money and I can give it to you. Or I can do the same thing, kind of what you're doing. I can show people to how to scale their business, but I don't I don't ever like I doubt how valuable the info information is. Like like if I were to say, Okay, what is your business now? You say, I'm doing this, this, this. Say, well, how are you doing that currently? And you go, I'm doing this, this, and this. And I'd say, okay, let's do more of that. <laughs> Pay me. Yeah. I, I I feel guilty because like, well, no shit. Well, that's how fucking easy it is. That's what you do. Like like Wait, whatever you do, whatever you do, I say, what are you doing right now? You say, well, I put an ad in the paper and I draw and I drive people to this page and whatever it is someone's doing. If they if they map out what it is that they're doing. And then they do more of what they're doing. They'll make more than they're making. Would you agree? Yes, but it's. It, it, I think business is different at five million than it was at one million, and I think there's a lot different, a lot of difference at ten million than five, and again at twenty, it's different than ten. And so the problems and the challenges um, change as they grow. And like, a lot of times, what I find is people come in, and you know, the answers to me seem simple. But they are stuck in this bottleneck of this problem that's in front of them, and it's a very simple fix. They just have a weird mental block a lot of times. And I'm like, yeah. come over here, look at it like this. You know, do this. Uh, are you willing to invest in businesses? Yeah. And that's, I haven't yet. Maybe but... you just joined me and my boy Derek Fay. You yeah. know Derek Fay? I don't know Derek Fay. Maybe you just join us. It's a good idea. Because Black the, Rhino Equity. People that that I've had in, I call it the inner circle, um, there are some really interesting businesses with a lot of potential for enormous quick growth. Well, you know Alex Hormozzi? Yeah. So he's got like acquisitions.com? Yeah. That's what he's doing. I know. Smart as hell too. Yeah. It's like there's people out there that want to grow their business and wait, you know how to grow businesses. Yeah. You know, let me help you. Give me a little PC piece, piece and, you know, a hundred businesses later, you're a billionaire. Yeah. Crazy, isn't it? It's wild. What if someone would have came along to you at some point and said, you know, pay me and I'll double your business back when you were doing the sober living? I did. It, it, you know, I hired all sorts of consultants and professionals and advisors and, you know. Uh, How much help did that give you in your mind, in your opinion? Some was good, some was bad. You know what I mean? A lot of the consultants I hired in, in hindsight were like, the thing that I like about what I do and what you do is that we're operators with the resume and the experience that we've actually achieved the results of shit we're teaching. Yeah. The problem when I look back at a lot of the people that I hired was my accountant is a good accountant and he might be the best accountant that money can buy, but he's never run a fucking business. And my lawyer hasn't either. And this consultant has an MBA from a prestigious school and, and whatnot, but has never actually worked in a business. They don't have the experience. And so that was kind of the missing link of a lot of the folks that I engaged. And I spent over the years millions and millions and millions of dollars in fees 
um, just learning because I'm a 15 year old high school dropout. I still don't have a GED. And so I had to learn from somebody. And that was a lot of the inspiration for why I started this. One, I like helping people. Business is interesting. I don't really do much else besides business. Um, but also having the experience and the resume to be able to help these people easily. And you say you didn't even get a GED. No. See, I went back and got my GED. Did you? Yeah. It's had to. I went to night school. The plan was I dropped out at 15 and, uh, and then I was, I was, uh, by the way, I was, what do you call it? Um, you know, valedictorian. Yeah. I was valedictorian of all the dummies getting their GED. <laughs> That's a thing. Yeah. I was valedictorian. I swear to God. I went to, I took a quarter of shrooms and went to night school one day and showed up and like tripping my fucking face off. And so, you know, wasn't that, wasn't that fun? It was fun. Fuck yeah. Yeah. But I, when I've done mushrooms, it was fun. Now, would I do mushrooms right now? Hell no. But not because I'm worried that I'll do more drugs. It's because, dude, I do not want my brain to melt at this age. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I've seen enough of that. Yeah. Okay, all I want now is normalcy. What I want is what I want is peace. Yeah. Um. So, so by the way, folks, if you're if you're not following him, you better be now. Eric Spofford. If you if you guys are business owners, you want to grow your business, you want to get a little uh, coaching and mentoring. You will take on some clients. Yeah. Yeah. Where do they go for that? Right on my Instagram at Eric Spofford. The links in my bio. And what what are you teaching these people? Just straight business, or do you do fitness, mindset, all the shit that's not, cool nowadays? Not fitness. That's not my thing. Um, but it's it's mindset. It's mental toughness. It's, you know, the funny thing, it's personal development. Do you have I exercises? That, what's that? Exercises? Like, for, for like in other words, is, is there a curriculum you put these people through? No. No. I just teach them, give them lessons, do Q&A, give them information. Um, I do give them assignments. I ask them to do things, look things up and, and certainly challenge them a lot, but there's no like certain curriculum. Um, every week we're covering a different topic. It might be sales. It might be talent acquisition, recruiting. What do you know about sales? I know how to hire good salespeople. I know how to tell me, tell you what, how to hire good salespeople. Cause I need to hire about 20 of them right now. Well, you know, plenty about hiring good fucking salespeople. <laughs> Apparently, I don't. Um, I put you know, a damn ad in the paper. A bunch of people show up and claim that they're kick ass, and then you give them a job, and they're not that kick ass. Yeah, I actually heard something interesting the other day. It said everyone wants to uh, say they have a great judge of character, but not if you base them on the people they've hired. <laughs> it's like fuck. <laughs> well, but I'm honest about it. So again, like I could sit here and be like, "Yes, I know exactly how to do it." I don't. If I did, I'd have fifty kick ass sales guys making twenty times the money I'm making. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what I do is, you know, look for the core attributes of good salespeople, self-starter, self-motivated, money-driven. How do you see that in an interview, though? You don't. You have to give a lot of people chances and structure the That's what I do. I'm a chance giver. Yeah. But I, I align the comp package and say, hey, listen, if you make a fucking million or $5 million a year, a year God bless. Because if you're making five, I'm making a lot. Okay. So there's another question real quick. Alignment. Well, when it comes to comp models, compensation models. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say I hired somebody and they're closing three deals a day with an average commission at 20% of $6,000. So they're making $18,000 a day, five days a week, answering my phones and presenting an offer. Isn't that too much? Not if you're making it. Doesn't matter what I'm making. If I, if I know that I can pay him nine thousand dollars a week to do it why would i let you make eighteen thousand a day that's a good point so i'd so I'd, now i would adjust that and i would say dude it's not worth 20 anymore it's now worth five because i only want you making x amount a month and then if you max that out i'd be like it's actually three percent with a two percent volume bonus and then pretty soon you just keep getting pencil whipped down to nothing well not down to nothing down to what i want you to make that's how real business is done. Not in my book, but that is how it's done. Yeah. Why? How do I know this? Because I've been pencil whipped. 
That's what it's called, pencil whip. Pencil whip. Never heard that before. You get you get pencil whip because like, I want you to make let's say fifty grand a month as my manager running my sales machine. Well, if 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 I give you five percent, right, override on the group. Now go kick ass. Go motivate them. Go teach them. Go get them going. I'll give you five percent of my money, my gross, and then you crush it, and I owe you five hundred thousand dollars, knowing full well, dude, you'd have done that for fifty thousand. Like you would not quit because I've changed your pay plan and now you're only going to make 50000 a month. I think it's dependent on the market, right? Well, obviously, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but in most cases, dude, businesses will keep you down. That's why I always say, dude, just go start your own business. That way you don't have to be, you know, beholden to somebody setting your pay plan. There's a lot of big differences between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur, though. You know, not everyone can go be an entrepreneur. Some might be people like the framework and the structure of, you know, showing up to a company and having rules and responsibilities, but ultimately it falls on your shoulders. I think anyone could. I just don't understand why they don't. Because they can't, or they don't want to, they're not motivated to, fear holds them back, they like the safety. Again, self-knowledge, self-awareness, you know? Not everyone has the balls to go out and say, I'm going to stick my fucking flag in the ground. This is my shit. You know, I'm going all in on me, taking all the risk and all of that. Not everyone wants to do that. If if they did want to do that, should they call you? They could. Should they, though? I mean, I'm really for active, for people that have, you know, businesses already that are cash flowing, that, that are already rolling. If you're looking to start a business... You could come in and watch and you would learn a lot and you could be a part of the community and you'd be with a, a an amazing group of really talented entrepreneurs. So for that reason, they should. Um, but how to start an LLC, how to, like, that's that's not me. That's the basic stuff there. The basic stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. You're, you're talking about, let me show you how you grow it from exactly seven to eight figures. Yep. How, what are the first thing you do when you exit? What is the first thing I do? Yeah, like you said, you, you start to help them prepare to be, to exit. Like, how? What do you do? Like, get the books in order. What, what's the first thing? you Look do? at finance. Look at compliance. Look at what a data room looks like. You know, do you have all your information? You know, start to think about what a due diligence process looks like. Do you reach out to a broker? At a certain point, yeah, I'll introduce investment bankers, introduce uh, M and A legal teams for them to interview. Any VCs? No, I've always left that to the banker, but because now that I'm a VC, which I don't even know what it is, <laughs> but it sounds cool, venture capitalist. I'm always wondering, like, you know, how do I start getting like into other deals? So, yeah, like, well, maybe, if, like I said, if you want to come in with our deals, to me, it's just now we got your money too. Yeah, no doubt. And now we need to do more deals. The question is, is are they good deals? Well, that's up to the team. You know, the eyeballs that look at the financials, because if because if you came in as a lead, I'd say, well, send me your financials. You know what's cool about some of your financials? All of a sudden, I'm like, damn, this motherfucker's profitable. All he's got to do is this, that, and the other thing. Well, now, so, dude, we got a winner here. You know what's funny about about the coaching thing um, is that the people that come into my universe always lead with everything that's wrong with their business. And so it's like I get to intimately know all the fucking problems before I proposition you for a deal. And so, like, you know, you think about the time and energy or resources you spent in due diligence trying to find the problems in a business before you invest. I get to know these companies from the inside out first. Would you consider that a poor negotiation tactic on their part? No. I, I, yeah, I mean, but the, no for the reason that they don't know that we're going to be negotiating. <laughs> I know, but like if I... If or not everyone that comes into the group is a business that I'm interested in. Or is that a proper life cycle for an investment? Not to mention if they don't, if they're not honest, uh, this, this is probably not going to go as well. Yeah, that's right. But at the end of the day, man, you know, I I would do stuff like that. My problem with it is number one is time. Like I know I got to be on calls with people all the time. Yeah. Number two, I don't think I value what I've done enough yet. Like I have to hit another couple levels to where I think I've done something. Because right now, everyone thinks I've done more than I think I've done. It's true. And everyone, everyone thinks I'm cooler than I think I am. You know, everyone thinks I'm richer than I actually am. I think everyone thinks I'm better than I actually am. Yeah. I give that appearance off. 
yeah. which is fine. You know, I, you, I'll let you assume whatever you want. But at the end of the day, if you just said, Brad, give me $250 million and I can, I can make it a billion in, in a week, but you got to write me a check today. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. That's what pisses me off. Keeps Why? me up at night too. Well, because I know people that can. Yeah. I know people that can go. Whoosh. And it's like, dude, that is the freedom I want. That is what I'm looking for. And I think I have three to five years, but I'm going to begin to exit three to five years before you actually want to exit. Yep. That's that's the tip I would give. That's right. And that's what I'll be thinking about that a long time ahead. Yeah. Well, that's what I've been doing. I'm preparing to to exit. Yep. But the first thing I did is, you know, get the books in order. Every dime coming in and out needs to be freaking looked at, scrutinized, reevaluated, and and every dollar that gets spent should be spent on getting new customers or keeping existing customers. Yep. Or it shouldn't be spent. And so the next three years, your expenses go down, your freaking revenue goes up. That some bitch is worth a multiple. What was what multiple you get? It was hard to calculate the multiple that I got because in healthcare, there's uh, different valuations placed on revenue sources from the payers. And so, for example, we were paid from uh, Medicaid, which is government health insurance. We were paid from commercial health insurance uh, on an in-network contracted basis. We had a bucket of private pay revenue, some out-of-network revenue. And Any so barters or trades? What's that? Any barters or trades? No. Barters you, and trades. You, you like, barter? Well, like, give me two horses and I'll send you some to rehab type of shit. No, we didn't do that. Um, and know, so or, every, or, or send your son to rehab, I'll save his life, but you, you owe me X. Yeah. Uh, no, we didn't do any of that, <clears throat> but we had, and so everything was, was valued at a different multiple, but the blended arbitrage of the EBITDA was, I, I had, had a $13 million trail in 12 month EBITDA. We sold for 115 and so. Beautiful news. Yeah. Well, dude, I'm glad shit worked out for you. What's next? Do you just, do you just enjoy coaching these folks? Enjoy, around? yeah, coaching's part of my day to day. I'm still very active in real estate. And then I launched another addiction treatment platform business called Treatment X. Uh, we've started our first facility in Columbus, Ohio. So back in the fight, in the mission, uh, opening a second facility in Ohio, a third one in Texas, and a fourth one coming online after that in New Jersey. Is this so, an investment opportunity? Not currently. No, I, I own all the real estate and I've put every every dollar infused for operating capital out of my own money. See, that's when you want to invest. Isn't that crazy? You want to invest when they don't want you to invest. Yeah. Because if they don't want you to invest, it's because they already know. Like, yeah. Why would I let you in? That's why I always tell when people ask me about deals that, that they're looking at, I'm, I just say, dude, ask yourself, why are they letting you in? Yeah. And unless it's a uh, it's a money thing, it doesn't make sense. A money thing means because if I had your money with my money, we could get there faster. We'd 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 do twice as much, exactly. and then I would take a piece of what I made you. So I, like I'll let people in for that reason. Yep. But but if I were just make if I figured out a way to freaking triple my money, and and it was limited to this, like you know, why would I let you triple it if I could triple mine? That's exactly it. That's why I'm, I'm gonna tri- I'm gonna triple right mine. I'm going to yeah. do it myself. But uh, if you do ever want investors, let me know. I sure will. Because obviously they're going to be successful. Number one, addiction hasn't gone away. It's not going away. I think, I think that as times get tougher, there's going to be more people addicted. I agree with you. Unfortunately. Yep. Um, and, it, you know, again, to me, if you want to get rich, help people. And that's helping people. That's the main reason. But anyway, good for you, bro. That's awesome, man. What a story. You know, there's a lot of people out there that didn't that didn't get the the happy ending. Yep. What would you, what would you uh, say to them if they're listening? Not that I have a bunch of crackhead followers listening, <laughs> just in case. Uh, you know, maybe they're not uh, start struggling with addiction themselves, but almost everybody in America has been affected somehow at this point. They know they love somebody, and you know, my one message around that is: as long as you're breathing, there's still hope. And you never know what the outcome's going to be. You really don't. And, um, you know, you put your head down and, and, you know, walk the uncommon path and you'll get a great result. Yeah, <laughs> my thumb sides. Well, all right, dude, well, I appreciate you coming all the way out here for this. Yeah, Folks, if you guys haven't already, go to Instagram, follow Eric Spofford, S-P-O-F, 
F-O-R-D. And until next time, keep it real.